There's never been a worse show than TNA Impact. Never in the history of wrestling has a show been booked so badly. It just hasn't been. I don't want to hear about Nitro. I don't want to hear Hell about no. Thunder. I was there for the end of Thunder. It was so much better than this. Not to mention the fact that WCW, as I've mentioned a million times, yes, they had a fall. But guess what? They fell from a peak. TNA has not had a peak. No. And they never will at this rate. It's one long, horrible valley. I, I will hereby make this prediction right now, and we won't be able to uh, verify this since they don't release numbers, but I think that based on feedback, we will find that I'm pretty goddamn close. 12,000 buys. 12,000 buys. That's all the show is on Sundays. And that may be high. I was going to say 12. That may be high. I just watched that show, and I just thought, who, who would ever buy this show? I have no idea. I bet Crumbly doesn't even buy this show. He's a big talker, but I bet he doesn't even buy this show. He'll get like a torrent or something. He will watch this show for free because he cannot bear to spend $30 on this shit. And it's in three days. This show just made me so angry. <laughs> That's so As it always does. No, I don't no, know why. Uh, I don't know why. Because it wastes your time. That's it. it you, it's not even. I have to watch this show, everybody. You have I don't to watch want, the show. I don't want people going on the thing and going. You don't have to watch this. If you, I do have to watch this. This is my job. I have to watch this show, and that's one of the things that makes me so angry about it. I would be so happy if I never had to watch another Impact again as long as I lived. You have no idea how happy I would be. Not as happy as I would be. If they just, if I just <laughs> had to watch you. the pay per views, great. I've been trying to talk to you and dumbing this show for years. If I just had to watch the pay-per-views, great. But I don't. I have to watch this television show. I have to keep up with this asinine, ridiculous, horribly written product. I don't understand how people watch this show every week. <laughs> I, I, I've long ago given up. Even the Christmas music didn't make me happy today. No, in fact, you're actually in a worse mood now than when we, right before we started. No, I was in a very bad mood. I was in such a bad mood I couldn't speak. That's that's the kind of bad mood that I was in. That's bad for a radio program. This show trolls me. Impact does, yeah. Every week this show trolls me. And they get a rise out of me every single week. It was all right last week. In fact, I think the last couple of weeks it was all right. Not this week. And, of course, the go-home show, as always. What a go-home show. A wretched go home show. This show was so bad. <laughs> the badness of this show was profound. See, you would think in a go home show, you would think virtually every segment would be tuned to making you want to buy the pay per view on Sunday. The defining moment of this show was a skit backstage with beer, money, and abyss. And a graphic came up on the screen that said, In six minutes, Kurt Angle confronts Jeff Jarrett for perhaps the last time. Begging. <laughs> they were begging people not to turn the channel. They were saying, we know you're thinking of turning out right now, but don't, because in six minutes, Angle and Jared are going to come out. Why else would you put that on the screen? No, I, that's a good point. I, <laughs> Why else would you put on the screen that in six minutes, the stars are coming out? Why would you do that? To let people know that it will just be Kurt, Yelly, and Jared, and you can turn away. They were encouraging people to tune out. No, they weren't. They I were know. they were begging people I to continue silly. watching the show. But You're no, seriously, point. answer the question though. Why would they put that on their screen? To make sure no one turns away. Okay. So why would you put that shit on television then? Because you think people are going to turn away. Vince, why would you put something on TV that's so bad oh, I see. Oh. that you have to put a disclaimer up asking them not to tune out right now because in six minutes the good stuff's coming? I don't know. Why would you put it on television? And if you're going to, why would it be that segment? There was so much on the show worse than that. But they, don't, they have no idea what's any good. They have literally no idea what is any good. Yes, that's They have clear. no idea what's good. That is abundantly clear. They have no idea what's bad. They just have no idea. This is the most clueless, clueless writing crew I've, I've ever, ever seen in my entire life. Just completely, utterly clueless. This show... We also have a lot of other stuff. I don't even about. give a shit about anything else. <laughs> show made me so angry. Oh, it's all I can think about. It's it's consuming me. I know we got to call Granny. And I know it's late, but I don't even care. She can wait. I hate to say that, but I'm I'm getting an impact right now. Get this thing over with, and then maybe just stop the show. Th this show just it makes me not like wrestling at all. I well, mean, this show really makes me hate my job. 
Badly. Quite horrible. Badly this man. And, and, and before this show, I watched ECW, which made me love my ECW job. ECW was awesome. Yes. I love ECW. Yes. And then I have to watch this. Thumbs down. I, 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 if I did not have to discuss TNA on the Wrestling Observer radio shows, I swear to God Almighty I'd quit. I just, this makes me hate this job. This fills me with anger. This fills me with, with, with rage. This is not good for me. Two hours of my life I have to waste every Thursday night watching this shit. You know, I, I drink during these shows almost every single time. And several times in the last hour, I kept reaching over for the bottle to realize it was now empty. Two hours of my life every week I have to spend watching this godforsaken show. And you know what? It actually opened with a good segment. And it was so amazingly downhill from there. <laughs> Bubba came out and basically gave a pep talk to all of the uh, all of the front line guys. And then the Mafia came out and, and invited them to join them. They had 60 seconds or they'd have signed their death certificate. So Bubba came out and, and cut this great promo about how the young guys were the future and the old guys had raped every company that they worked for. Started talking about... Um, I'll talk about more about the code later, but anyway. Uh, then, of course, the front line came out and got in the crowd, and Rhino did a promo saying that Sunday would be the end of Curtain TNA. Said he was one gore away from the unemployment line. He said if Curtain didn't believe that, he'd believe it later tonight when he kicked the shit out of Sting. This was the best young guys versus old guys segment that they have ever had. Yeah, actually, I guess it would be. Um, we talked about mission before. Brother Ray is an awesome, awesome promo. He was awesome tonight. He was in rare form, even by his standards, and uh, it, it, it everyone got excited because all the wrestlers were around them, and it all made everything made sense. And, uh, well, with the exception of the code and the part where, where where Ray said, "We're bad guys, but not when it comes to doing the right thing," <laughs> a sentence that I do not understand. But uh, it, it made it clear that he was passionate and 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 uh, and uh, you know uh, loyal to the front line, and and he was going to help them kick the. Uh, Mafia's ass. And they made it literally clear that they would be Joe and AJ's partners, which had not been in the week before, so that was good, too. And Borash did a promo saying TNA Mobile was now free, so apparently it was not doing well at all. And He also said that if you text us something to the mobile thing right now, you would find out who would be in Kurt Angle's corner on Sunday. And by the way, for those of you that did text, you didn't find out who was going to be in his corner. Awesome. He didn't. They said it would be a, a former, one of his former tag partners. So now if you're wondering why this is free and why it didn't do very well, there's your answer right there. I don't think people used to pay for that. They teased information and then, of course, did not give the information. That's a bad business model. And then we had the beautiful people freaking out because Sarah Palin was about to show up. And speaking of awful, I'll get into that later. Borash met with Booker and Charmel and wanted to know why they hired the beautiful people and why Booker was defending his title against Joe in a street fight tonight. We were, by the way, 17 minutes into the show and had zero wrestling at this point. 17 minutes and uh, four segments. Yeah, four segments, 17 minutes, no wrestling on total nonstop action wrestling here. So I have no idea what he said. Apparently Booker is now a Mexican. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. all I got out of this. He thing. was so excited to fight Joe that he broke character at the end. There was a promo about how great TNA is. yip de doo Then we had the first match of the evening, believe it or not. Actually, no. Sorry, before that, we got one of those bullshit cross-the-line promos. Cross the line of total nonstop action. 19 minutes into the show and still not a wrestling match. Booker and Joe for the Legends title in a street fight. Two minutes and then a commercial, of course. And then Joe made a comeback, got the choke. Charmel took the ref. This is a street fight, by the way, in the opener with a uh, distraction from a manager. And then the beautiful people ran down and spit uh, or actually sprayed perfume or something in Joe's eyes, and then he was hit with the axe kick for the pin. And so, uh, yes, Joe got beat by two girls. <laughs> you know, I'd read somewhere. He did. He yeah. got beat by two girls. Well, he got beat by hairspray. But uh, That's even worse. <laughs> I'm just telling you what happened. Joe got beat by hairspray. Uh, but there was uh, something, I, I believe it was actually on, on our site, but it said that Joe gave Booker T his best match since joining the company. Who wrote that? I don't know. Crumbly? I don't know. Jesus. It was, it was a false. A false statement. The Mafia was cackling backstage. This was one of the rare good segments on this show. Sort of. 
Scott Snyder cut one of his promos, one of those promos you have to watch about three times, one to listen to him, and another time to watch the reaction of everybody else in their complete befuddlement. <laughs> and then the, just the fact that this made the air is, he, is worthy of a third viewing. He was going off about how Team 3D, who he called Bubba Ray, by the way, yeah. he uh, said they, they hadn't been where he had been and hadn't done what he had done, and he was everything was going fine, and suddenly he just got completely flustered. Yes. And he... Almost said fuck and caught himself, and he ended the quote uh, the, the promo by saying, and I quote, "I'm let's come on." Yeah, and he left, and you heard him hit something hard off camera. This was exactly like the Lex Luger promo with the T-shirt that was too small, <laughs> yes. which became a YouTube joke. This was actually on the, on national TV. Yeah, he walked off camera, struck something with great fury. Nash and Sting kind of glanced at each other. Sting put his hand up to his mouth to cover his laugh, and they followed. Yeah. We had a series of best of moments with Angle, since of course this could be his final impact. You know that, that, that right there, by the way, awesome enough. They hyped Angle as the 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 best thing in the world, and then said you may never see him on the show again. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> and he's supposed to be a heel. And he's supposed to be a heel. Amazing. Lauren was trying to console Joe backstage as he sat there with a towel over his head like a complete loser, and then Team 3D walked in and told him to stop being a pussy. They said he lost a match, big deal. And uh, then we got a fantastic moment as they explained that Flair had been the world champion 16 times, meaning he lost it 15 times. Apparently fact, he is still champion. And the fact that they had uh, been tag team champions 20 times meant they lost it 19 times. And I checked their large waists. There were no belts there. No. Bubba Ray can't do math. I thought I was bad at math. <laughs> wow. Everything else about the promo was fine. They gave me a pep talk. They said everyone loses once in a while. It's how you got to get back up and get back in the game. Team that was 3D fine, was a shining beacon of light on this show. They were. Think about that, everybody. They, they've taken the place of Jim Cornette, who used to be the only good thing on the show. Now it's Team 3D. ODB's angle with Roxy and Taylor Wilde. The worst segment to ever make television. This, I, I wrote this. I wrote that in the 15 years that I have been doing this newsletter, actually 13, almost 14, I have never seen a, a segment as bad as this. I don't even know where to begin. I don't even talk about it. Just, I refuse to acknowledge this segment. It, it was the worst thing ever. And, by the way, we got a segment later that was even worse, if you can even believe that. I, I don't. Abyss was trying to kill James Storm backstage, and they talked him into having a drink. And, of course, this ended up with them drinking like crazy. The monster fell off the wagon. Yay. Then the fake Sarah Palin arrived. 46 minutes into the show, by the way, and we'd had six minutes of wrestling so far. Total nonstop action, everybody. 46 minutes into the show, and we'd have six minutes of action so far. And then a fake Sarah Palin arrived on Impact. This was the worst impersonator I've ever seen. The only possible way this could have been worse is if they would have had a man do it. <laughs> I have no idea what this accent she was supposed to be that she was attempting to perform. It was not even remotely funny. The beautiful people freaked out and began screaming at the top of their lungs and giggling. It was horrible. I... It was horrible. How did stuff like this make television? I have no idea. That's, because that, they the way... don't know what's good, and they don't know what's bad. That is the third time we have asked that in the past six segments. It will only get worse from here. We got another bullshit dramatic TNA promo trying to make us care about Awesome Kong versus Christy Hemi. They had video of Christy and AJ training, the highlight of which was when she went to do a lockup, and he immediately stopped and almost literally rolled his eyes, as if to say, what the fuck was that? This is a look I've seen Buddy Wayne give me a thousand times. A thousand times. And uh, I know what it means, and it is not the kind of thing you want to put on TV indicating this chick is a great wrestler. But they did. But they did. And why is that? Because they have no idea, they have what's, no good, idea what's good, and they have no idea what's bad. Then we had Awesome Kong and Scott Steiner against Christy Hemi and AJ Styles. That, by the way, before this was seven straight segments without a match. Yes. So, they had a match, and uh, AJ wiped out Steiner near the finish. Kong and Christy were the legal woman, and... It ended up with AJ picking up Christy and hitting Kong with her, as if Christy was a foreign object. And then he put her in position for a tornado DT, and Christy Hemi pinned Awesome Kong. I 
I just short circuited. <laughs> you just broke. You cannot handle the, this appearing on TV. This is not the worst thing on the show. Christy Hemi pinned Awesome Kong. Because they were stupid and booked this match in the first place, they then realized not one person, not one person on the earth will believe Christy can win this match unless we show her pinning Kong. People are going to say, Brian, why are you so mad that that uh, Eric Young did not get the pin later, but you're angry that Christy Hemi got the pin on Awesome Kong in this match? This match never should have been made. There never should have been a scenario where Christy Hemi was going to pin Awesome Kong. Yeah. Essentially clean. Basically, sort of. Christy Hemi pinned she, Awesome Kong. She hit her with a move and pinned her. This was idiotic. <laughs> I, I assume this means Christy's not winning on the pay-per-view now. No, I hope she pins Kong. Clean. What and wins the title. Well, the, who gives a fuck now? The backslide. Just kill this company. Just kill it. Put it out of its misery. So, then we had Angle meeting with Foley, telling him if he screwed him at the pay-per-view, Foley would never walk again, and Foley said he was just there to make sure this match was one-on-one, and Angle said, well, fine, I'm bringing my own uh, guest something or other. I don't, I, somehow, Kurt said he wanted a one-on-one. That's why he was bringing someone in his corner. And apparently the main event mafia has been banned, but he can bring someone else. So he announced there would be a mystery person in his corner. The key here is that this is where he introduced it, and a half hour earlier, JB was saying to call the mobile thing and you could find out who it was. Yeah. Bad. This that didn't even enter my radar. Well, that didn't On I the level of badness on this show, that did, didn't even count. Well, I caught it. <sighs> then we had Beer Money and Abyss still drinking backstage. They were all hammered. This was by far the best thing on the show. <laughs> they looked like they were having so much fun. Until the part where Jackie was forced to sit on his lap and give him a kiss, and Abyss, who was supposed to be a big, tough baby face, said, Does that mean I'm not a virgin anymore? Right. Can you possibly find a way to make this man less cool than he already is? <laughs> well, they did. A big, fat virgin? <laughs> He's now a big, fat, stupid virgin. I don't write this stuff, everybody. Who can't hold his liquor, by the way? Who can't hold his liquor? My God. My God. He is less cool than you right now. I totally agree. How could such a thing have been created on national television? If you and Abyss went out, you would have a better chance of getting some than Abyss. God, I would hope so. Jeez. I see that with hesitation. Jimmy Rave and Sanjay Dutt and the terrorist against Eric Young, Consequences, Creed, and Jay Lethal. Of course, by sheer coincidence... Random chance, Shane Sewell was the ref again. Yeah. And the Sheik finally said, Jesus Christ, this is bullshit. <laughs> and he finally went over to the announcers and said, look, if Shane goddamn Sewell is ref, I'm not having any part of this. And he stayed at the announcers the entire time. So, of course, that left it three on two advantage baby faces. Right. Because these people have no idea what is good and what is bad. <laughs> I... <laughs> so then these stupid motherfuckers... They had the finish, which was uh, Creed hitting Rave with a TKO for the pin. Immediately afterwards, the mad Iraqi goes and starts beating up Young. Eric Young. Eric Young, everybody. And what did I ask? Why is he beating up Eric Young? And what did you respond? Well, Brian, Eric Young is getting a title shot this Sunday. So why did Eric Young not win the match? Because, Brian, these people have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> This, by the way, again, this even more than whatever, the, even more than the uh, angle corner man thing. This is even more off the radar than that. But I have to point it out anyway. The sheik was on the at the announce desk talking about Shane Sewell and talking about how we all know what he did in Puerto Rico. And we all know what he did in Canada. I have no idea what this man did in Puerto Rico and Canada. One time, Cornette said he wrestled there. Woohoo! Then, yeah. <laughs> there was a video package for Feaster Fired where oh. everyone talked about, they, they almost everyone said, I might get fired, but it's worth it for the chance to get a title shot. They did their best with this stupid concept when they could. But not Chris Saban. <laughs> Chris Saban, who may be my new favorite wrestler for this, he said, and I, I wish I had, take, I had written this down, but this is, this is very close to what he said. 
Feasts are fired is a special time of year when grown men in tights fight over boxes on poles. <laughs> it was like very, very close to that. Yeah. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Everybody here knows what a clusterfuck this is. He couldn't even he couldn't even pretend to take this seriously. For anybody that thinks like we're too hard on TNA and that we're mean, get real. <laughs> the people who work in this company are so well aware of what a ridiculous cornball clusterfuck this place is. That is why people are leaving. And that is why this spring there will be an even bigger uh, number of people leaving, provided WWE wants them. Or they may just quit and go to ROH, who knows. But or they may just get out of the business. Sell cars. I swear to God, I'd just get out of the business. If I were a wrestler and I were with TNA and my contract was going to come up, I would just... If, yes. I, I'd go back to coaching gymnastics full-time. Anything. Anything. I, I could not work in this place. Wash dishes. So, then what did we have? Oh, um, Sting promo. No. Oh, yeah, Sting. It was not much to it. He's all wrought up. He's he's the straw over the AJ Styles thing, but he says he'll be part of a family at the show. So then we had more with the beautiful people and the fake Palin. This this was a new worst segment I have seen in almost 14 years of covering professional wrestling. The only good thing about it was Booker T called the fake Sarah Palin a yak. That was literally the only good thing about this entire wretched, wretched segment. Vinny, now that the show's over, what was the point of the Sarah Palin thing? I have no idea. Not a clue. I don't know what it led to. I don't know what it produced. I don't know if uh, they thought people would tune I'll tell you what it produced. Bad television. It produced some very, very bad television. I have no idea what any of it accomplished. I will, however, however disagree with you. ODB's angle was worse than this. I don't know. I, I do. At least this had Booker T calling Sarah Palin a yak. Well, that's true, but the there, first one didn't. There was one positive segment in this. The first one had a, a horrible Sarah Palin impersonator and girls screaming and acting giddy over a fake Sarah Palin. That was bad. I, that I, was worse than ODB's angle. No, no, ODB's no, angle was worse. I'll tell you why. Okay. I'll tell you why it was worse. Because there was not a single redeeming thing about it. What was her DM about ODB's angle? Because I cackled when at the very end Roxy said, we'll fuck those bitches up, and they had to bleed the whole thing out. That was funny. That made you laugh. Yeah. I disagree with you, but it was I, so I, ridiculous. But I will accept that argument. They used the line, we'll fuck those bitches up, on TNA. Well, and then, of course, we didn't hear it because they had to bleed the whole thing out. Well, that's so Roxy's, why bother saying it? That is Roxy's gimmick. Roxy's gimmick is that she's a potty mouth. Awesome. <laughs> Taylor's gimmick is that she's she's poor and makes her own clothes. Awesome. ODB's gimmick. I still don't understand where she is. It doesn't but matter. This that was promo, one funny thing. I must. I, apparently, you don't understand how bad this was, so I must revisit it. ODB was sitting back drinking. Her first question was, "I'm not making this up." So, Roxy, what's your story? So, Roxy, what's your story? And Roxy began to explain. That she's from Boston. She was wearing a shirt that read, Dorks are hot. And she said she liked to play video games and watch movies. <laughs> I'm supposed to want to see her fight now? <laughs> really? And then it got to Taylor, who was looked ridiculous, and she said she had made this dress by herself as a tribute to ODB for Christ knows what reason. And then ODB was her usual noxious self. That was worse, Brian. ODB's anger was no, the worst thing I ever said, saw. We'll fuck those bitches up. Then we had rough cut with LAX. This was good. This again. This, I, they, they do these. Like, this, this. I said it last week, and I, I didn't mean it because last week's show was all right. But this should have been two hours. Yeah. They, 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 they this go should for have been a, the whole show. Perhaps a minute. And it's homicide. A minute. Fuck. Uh, Thirty seconds. Whatever. But they did not go long enough. But it was homicide. Hernandez talking about how much they love wrestling and how much it means to them when fans tell them they, they appreciate them and all their friends talking about how hard they work and stuff. And it was awesome. Then we had the final Abyss Beer Money segment where they broke a bottle over Abyss's head at the end. This was, by the way, when they were begging us not to change the channel because the main eventers were coming out in six minutes. So they broke this beer bottle over Abyss's head, and then they were cutting a promo on him about how they weren't going to lose their belts at the pay-per-view. And in the middle of this promo, they went to commercial. Right. They didn't even wait until the promo building up the pay-per-view was over to go to commercial. No. They went to commercial in the middle of the promo. Yeah. A serious question here. This is a, a God's, as God is my witness, is a serious question. Why bother with this show? 
I have not no me idea. And you, not me and you. Why does TNA bother with Impact? They must think it's good. See, we were saying all show they have no idea what's good. I think that's the wrong thing to say. Because if they had no idea, they would be trying all sorts of different things. Whereas they're trying shit. They just think their shit is good. But well, I don't understand why you waste all the time and expense of creating this show every week. I don't it, either. If it is going to be so ineffectual. I have no idea. Why would you cut away in the middle of a guy building up a pay-per-view match unless you're just a goddamned idiot? The answer to that, I think, this is the best answer I can come up with. They, they ran out of time on the show because they only have two hours. Rather than cut something, rather than reshoot anything they had in there, they just cut it off in the middle. So the answer, I guess, Brian, would be that they are lazy. Why not just run a pay-per-view every month? You'll get the same 25,000 people. They they did before. They, 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 their, their pay-per-view buy rates before they had television. <laughs> and their pay-per-view buy rates when they've got 1.5 million viewers are the same. <laughs> That's so why no good. bother with the television? I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know. What, to sell your pay-per-view that nobody, or your, your video game that nobody bought? To plug your your house shows that the attendance is cut in half after you go there one time? Why do you have this show? I don't get it. I don't I I, I don't know. Just run your pay per view, get your twenty five thousand viewers, and quit making people suffer through this shitty, useless television show. You know, very, very early in the show they were talking about what was gonna be on and they mentioned very quickly under the breath that it could be Kurt Angle's last impact ever. And you and I had the exact same reaction. We had heard the words, last impact ever! <laughs> and we like, sat up, and we rewound it, and then we heard the whole thing, and we went, oh, and we lurched back down. So Angle came out and cut a promo on Jeff Jarrett. About- Actually, no. Kurt Angle came out and he said, I'd like to call out Jeff Jarrett. And as soon as he got to the second T in Jarrett, the instant he said that, Jarrett's music played, Jarrett comes out with a mic and guitar. Apparently, he had been hanging out by the entranceway just in case Kurt Angle happened to come out and call him out. Well, of course he was. There was an alert that they were coming out in six minutes. Uh, yes. Now, shut the fuck up. I need to get this over with. Angle came out and cut a promo on Jarrett, which is, in fact, what happened, thank you. And he ran him down. He talked about how he was going to kill Rhino. He was going to move on and kill Foley. And then he was going to move on to Jeff. And he talked about how when all was said and done, he was going to own his company and own him. And he said he had never been like this, so out of control that he didn't know what he was going to do with Jeff when he got him in the ring. Angle's delivery was phenomenal here. However, for those of you not paying attention, they're not wrestling on Sunday. No. They're not wrestling until January. And, in fact, not only are they not wrestling until January, they flat out said they weren't wrestling until January, and they plugged that pay-per-view. Why would anyone buy this show Sunday? I have no Why would idea. you not wait for the big show? I have no idea. In fact, they told you with that six-minute deal that the main eventers are these two men, and they're not wrestling till the next show. So why would you buy <laughs> Sunday's show? I, I wouldn't. I never would. It was dumb. And then, just to, to make it both stupid and tasteless, he also referenced Jeff's dead wife again. Lovely. Great. Now I can't wait. Jeff don't care. Apparently. Scumbag. That's right. What did what did uh, AJ say? That's right, I said it. Who was that on this fucking show? Oh, it was uh, was it Bubba Ray? Somebody. I forget. I short circuited again. So, uh, so they spent several minutes here plugging Jarrett and Angle, which is not happening on Sunday. Seventh straight non-match segment. Yeah. Then they went backstage to Rhino, which would be the eighth straight non-match segment. Poor Rhino, who actually is in the main event and is being ignored. And so he tried to say, I feel the same way Jeff does. I have a daughter, too. Then he turned to the camera and said, Kurt, you've crossed the line. Is Isn't that, that what everyone's supposed to do? Isn't that what we want to happen? I thought we were supposed to cross the line. I thought that was the whole point of the show, was to cross the line. And then he said, for the second time in the show, you broke the code. No, here's what happened. He starts crying about his kids at home and Angle's kids at home, and they said he'd broken the code among the boys. He did not say what the code among the boys was. I hate the show. I have no idea why it is such a difficult concept to talk about things that fans understand and can relate to. Fans don't give a shit 
about what Angle thinks about his kids. Fans don't give a shit what Rhino thinks about his kids. And fans don't have any fucking idea what the stupid code is that people are supposedly breaking among the boys. The boys. They should have had a graphic up. B-O-Y-Z. The boys. Fuck off, TNA. I've never been filled with such rage for this program. Then we had Joe Angle and Team 3D cutting a promo backstage, which would be, in fact, the ninth... The ninth segment in a row with no wrestling here on Total Nonstop Action Wrestling. So, they did a promo, and I'll spoil it for everybody here. Actually, I won't because, of course, nothing in TNA ever makes sense. The only thing that makes sense after watching this show is that Samoa Joe turns heel on Sunday and joins the Mafia, and Sting turns babyface and joins the good guys. That is the only thing that makes sense. Now, of course, that's not going to happen because nothing in TNA makes sense. But that is what a normal human being would get out of watching this segment. But, of course, there's got to be a swerve. There's got to be all this other bullshit, such as the main event where Sting faced Rhino, and they immediately went to commercial break. They came back, and there was blood everywhere. Then, of course, Angle came down to interfere. Then AJ came down to interfere. And during the distraction, Rhino Gord Sting pinned him. Rhino pinned Sting to set up a match with Kurt Angle. Rhino pinned the world champion to set up a match with Kurt Angle. Right. Well, of course. <laughs> this is a terrible, 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 terrible program. It was a very, very bad show. It was one of the worst editions of TNA Impact you will ever see. It's the worst show I've ever seen in my life. This Trump the... Barbed wire Christmas tree show. I because at least that was funny, and I still laugh about it a year later. Completely agree. Actually. I will never ever this is, ever. And 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 if you know what this was, no buys. <laughs> That's a little drop. You heard me. No buys. Do it again. I need a flag. <laughs> no buys. I hate this show. Well, the uh, in one. Nope. Stop. I, I'm. A, nope. I'm a, turn down. Oh, no. Fucker. No. I'm done talking about TNA. Oh, done. Done. No, I don't even want to hear it. Done. To the back. We're going to start off with Vinny here as we recap the TNA Final Resolution pay per view match by match. This pay-per-view was better than Impact. I realize that is faint praise, but at this point, anything is praise for yes. a TNA. Main event was was actually pretty damn good. The Feast or Fired match was pretty fun, and there were a lot of plugs for Thursday. So I realize that a lot of people probably found some way to watch this show for free, and uh, for those of you that paid for it, I don't know what to tell you. I know I, I paid the 30 bucks, and I felt like a fool most of the time as they told me that all the big stuff was actually happening on Thursday. Very similar to how I'm going to feel next Sunday when I'm paying $40 for a WWE pay-per-view. And meanwhile, I've just seen a much bigger show on Monday, the Slammy Show, which is a three-hour show with three matches that are bigger than anything available in the WWE pay-per-view. I have no idea what's going on with the promotion in 2008, except that something's wrong. Clearly, wrestling has passed you by. It's passed everybody by, apparently, because, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, let's talk about this show here. Open up with Feast or Fired. Cute Kip, Guru, Jimmy Rave, Lance Rock, Alex Shelley, BG James, Jay Lethal, Chris Sabin, Consequences Creed, Curry Man, Hernandez Homicide, and Shark Boy. Of course, a pole match. There's a briefcase on each pole, and three of them are title shots, World X and Tag, and in one of them was a pink slip. Why anybody would risk their career for this match, I have no idea. And well, this- Brian, Don West tried to explain that. And what he said was, and I'm not making this up, for most of the guys in this match, is the only chance at a title shot they will ever get. All right, let's, let's see. Cute Kip has gotten tag title shots. Guru has been... Actually, Cute Kip, I think, has been uh, tag team champion. Maybe he wasn't with BG James. He but he has had title shots. They've had title shots. Uh-huh. Guru has had title shots. Jimmy Rave and Lance Rock... They may not have. They may not have. Alex Shelley has. BG James has. Jay Lethal's been champion. Because Saban uh, was champion multiple times. Saban has been champion. Consequences Creed has been champion, if I recall correctly. Wasn't he? I don't think so. But, but he got a title shot for sure. 
Curry Man maybe never got a title shot. Hernandez and Homicide, Homicide have been champions. Yes. And uh, Shark Boy. So anyway, this is still retarded. So they had this match. It was a... Um, for those of you that have watched a lot of TNA pay-per-views, director Keith Mitchell is completely incompetent. And it's well known in the industry, but he's good friends with Jeff Jarrett, so he keeps his job. This guy can't even keep his camera work stable for singles matches. So you can imagine a match with 13 men in the ring. A cornucopia of cocksuckiness was this match. So they did a bunch of different stuff and um, ended up with Hernandez getting the first briefcase. And the story was that you couldn't just get the briefcase off the pole. It was a battle royal, you see. So you had to get it off the pole, and then you had to touch the ground with two feet in order for this to count. So he got one, and then Curry Man got one, and they were trying to prevent him from leaving. So he did a flip dive to the outside and actually splatted flat on his back on the ground. And I suspect at that exact moment he thought, boy, I hope I get fired. Then we had Homicide and Sanjay fighting for one. Sanjay got crotched. So Homicide climbed up on his back and got the briefcase. Not before they pointed out Homicide was too short to reach the briefcase staying in the top rope. And it was finally guns destroying everybody else. And then uh, Saban stood guard. Shelly grabbed the briefcase. But, of course, you had to touch the floor, and they were unaware of this. So they celebrated with the briefcase, which allowed Jay Lethal to do a springboard, grab the briefcase in midair, slide outside for the pin. The finish was awesome. This was a three-and-a-quarter star match. It was a wacky collection of fun spots if you ignore the stupidity of the match itself. Uh, there, were, there were bodies flying everywhere, and as noted, there was, it was often too much to keep track of. And the extra stupid thing about all these multiple-man matches TNA does is the whole point of the Battle Royal is it's a bunch of chaos that comes down to a clear finish. And these matches where no one gets eliminated is just a bunch of chaos all the way through, so it's hard to peek. Although these guys did their best, and there was some fun stuff with the guns and cute little spots uh, with with uh, Sanjay Dutt and the machine gun. I said the machine guns running wild, and uh, uh, Homicide border-tossing Rave out of the ring onto a giant pile of men, which is still a terrifying spot. Uh, so, yeah, if you just watched it, if you just watched the action and didn't think about what was going on, this is really fun. If you thought about what was going on and you realized how stupid this match was, you were kind of annoyed, especially at the end, when they focused on the four winners, congratulated them, and had offered them a chance to turn down their uh, prizes. Hold on, we're getting ahead of ourselves. All right. The first match went about 15 minutes, and the second match did not start until 37 minutes into the pay-per-view. Total nonstop action. We had one match in 37 minutes, and it was a 15-minute match. Now, how does that happen? Well, angles. Plenty of angles here on this pay-per-view. Borash did, in fact, allow them all to um, to vacate their briefcase if they wanted to, which, of course, if you're going to do that, why would you be in the match? Why would you be in the match in the first why place? Why would you have grabbed the briefcase? Why would you? Yes, why don't you, Chris Harris did last year, get up top, change your mind, and climb back down? Yeah. So Lethal's number was drawn after nobody volunteered to give it back, and yes, the machine did. guns were still in the ring, very unhappy about the fact that they had been supposedly screwed here. So after much rigmarole, it was opened up, and Jay Lethal has got the tag title shot. And the guns, who were supposed to be heels, as soon as he opened up this briefcase, everyone chanted bullshit because they wanted the guns to have the tag team title shot. So the guns continued to freak out to the point of great annoyance because... Get him out of the ring. I mean, I realize this was an angle, but it just made TNA look so low rent that they had nobody to get these geeks out of the ring for like ten straight minutes. Well, Brian, it turns out they did have someone capable of putting the guns in their place. That enforcer of TNA, the arm of the law, Jeremy Borash. Cut a promo on him. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Called Shelly a total nonstop asshole and then stormed out, and, and uh, that was the end of the segment. And he, he, he left them slack-jawed and humbled. Jerry Borash, everybody, mm -hmm. buried the machine guns and got nothing in retribution. Just left them stunned and chained in the middle of the ring. That was dumb. Then we had the beautiful people in Charmel backstage, and uh... <laughs> I'm going to address Charmel's first comment here. She said she may look and act like a lady, but underneath the package she was something else. <laughs> huh? And that did not make you want to see any more. Perhaps a yak is what she meant. And then she left. So. The beautiful people cut a promo, and this started out great. And then, as noted, the second match didn't start until 37 minutes into the show. So this went, I swear this felt like five minutes. They just went on and on and on and on. Then they got another call, supposedly from Sarah Palin, who was coming back to impasse on Thursday. So remember on Thursday when I said that nobody in this company knows what is good or what is bad? That is abundantly clear. 
They thought the Sarah Palin thing was good. When, in fact, it was bad. It was bad. They think that it was good that she did not know that this place was called Impact. That is bad. So, anyway, she's coming back on Thursday, and even Cute Kip thought this was retarded. Yes, Cute Kip is... <laughs> Cute Kip finds this whole angle below him. He is so awesome when he's just in the background reacting to what the beautiful people say. If you go back, for those of you who have seen the award-winning paper bag bandit, when you watch my buddy Sean, who plays the sheriff's deputy, and he's in the background as Brian and I are, are, are hatching a nefarious plot to, uh, to, to, basically, to basically to frame a bandit, Sean's in the background reacting to everything. Cute Kip has the same shtick, and it's great. Then we have the second match, 37 minutes in. Charmel and the Beautiful People against ODB, Roxy, and Taylor. I, I refuse to give this match a rating because in the middle of this match, I, I did in fact walk out of the room. This is my new, this is my new, um, uh, it's, it's what I do now to avoid having my mind, uh, ripped apart by the idiocy of TNA. They had a match and it started with, you had three girls against three girls, and they wanted to get the heat on one of the girls by using a double team. Now, apparently, in order to, um, I guess in order to not have this double team be a disqualification, they needed some distraction. So, Cute Kip, who is almost seven feet tall, Cute Kip got in the ring. He got into the ring to distract the ref so the ref wouldn't see a double team in a tag match. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, three seconds later, there was a double team right in front of the ref, and it made no difference. So, of course. And then later in the match, Cute Kip got in the ring and actually slapped ODB across the face. He struck a woman. A seven-foot man got in the ring and struck a woman across the face. This was not a DQ. That's when I just quit. <laughs> just I don't give ring. a fuck. I just quit. There was much, much other stupidity. Uh, really you know stu- what? I don't want to hear about it. I just give up on this match. <laughs> match finished. There was much, much dumbness. Eric Young was doing an interview about Bashir when the machine guns walked up and wanted to talk to Borash, and Eric cut a big promo on him, and they eventually... He actually said this was about their spot, he said. Their spot. Eric Young has got to preserve the spot that he's in right now, which I don't know what that spot (laughs) is, but it ain't no good. He was also sure to point out that he has now moved to America, so it's okay to cheer him because he's not an evil Canadian. Wow. So Shelley said, listen, we're on your side, now go to your match. And after they left, they slammed Borash into the locker and told him they would spare him this time as long as he told them where Foley was. And Borash said, well, he's in his office. So why did he just look there first? I have no earthly idea. But it's TNA. There is little thought put into any of this. Or there's start... a great deal of thought by people that don't have brains. <laughs> if One you're going to complain about that logic gap in the show, we're going to be here for 17 hours. That's fine. That's fine. I look for every logic gap. Oh, you, think... you skipped over a bunch of them in the Charmel match. Why do you think Jim Cornette doesn't watch any wrestling programming anymore? Because none of it makes sense. Because he he takes me to a new level. If you think I go crazy recapping this show, you could not even imagine Jim Cornette analyzing impact segment by segment. It would take <laughs> 18 hours, and he'd be dead by the end. <laughs> He, would, he may not actually inhale the entire time. Speaking of logic gaps, we had Sheikh Abdul Bashir against Eric uh, Young for the X title. And uh, you recall that on Impact, the Sheik refused to wrestle in a match, a six man tag match with nothing on the line, but Shane Sewell was the ref and he refused to wrestle. Tonight, with his X title on the line, Shane Sewell was the ref again. This time, the Sheik was cool with it. Sure. So, of course, they also announced that Shane Sewell had two strikes on his record and one more and he might be fired. And I just thought, why not just not have him ref? <laughs> is, is there like a is there a storyline reason why he has to ref this match? He has to he only ref the Sheik's matches. He couldn't do the girls' match. No, of course not. He couldn't do Feast or Fired. If, if 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 anybody in this company thought for two seconds, they would realize that it, to make this work, have Shane Sewell ref, ref another match as yeah. well. <laughs> this is this is far beyond their capacities of of logic and reason. So anyway, he was a referee. They had a final match, two and a half stars. And ended with Shane Sewell getting slapped, but he somewhat kept his cool. And then Young did a sunset flip. Bashir grabbed the ropes. Sewell kicked his hands off and counted the pin. Don found this to be unfair, by the way. Even though Bashir was, in fact, grabbing the ropes illegally, and the ref was completely in his rights to kick his hands off. This has happened for decades. We've seen this finish a thousand times in my life. To be honest, it's never made sense to me, but it's the precedent that has been set. I'm fine with it. And this finish is legal. So then Bashir slapped him. Shane sewled up, ran wild. The place was going haywire. And Bashir finally clonked him with the belt and Sewell juiced, leaking blood. And Bashir then finally bit his head, and he had his mouth covered with Sewell's blood. And 
I don't think Shane Sewell has any diseases, but I will say that anybody that has worked regularly for a period of time in Puerto Rico, their blood would never be in my mouth. I would just like to say that right here. It's a chance not worth taking. Shane Sewell was fucking unbelievably awesome in this match, though. He is the best worker in TNA, I've decided. Well, duh. That's been decided for months now. But uh, this was a, a, a fine little match and a good little posting angle, but they, they, they can never just do anything good. They have to always do something wacky. And this, and this one, the Sheik clunked Shane with the belt. Then he turned to Eric, and he went to clunk with the belt, but Eric ducked and fired up until the Sheik dumped him outside. So the end result was Eric Young was taken out anyway. Why, did, why, why not just let him get hit with the belt? I don't know. Why to make things complicated? That's, no. Nah. There's there's some way more to bitch about. I'm so sure there is, but but two and a half stars, everybody. A pretty good match. There's a positive. Awesome Kong and Christy Emmy for the knockouts title. This was not a positive. Long story short, Christy hit her fire crotch leg drop on Awesome Kong, and Raisha pulled her out of the ring. So the story they repeatedly told was Christy Hemi was about to beat Awesome Kong clean. Women's division's dead. So anyway, Raisha pulls her out of the ring right for the ref. This is not a DQ, of course. So then Raisha and Raka are pounding the shit out of her outside right in front of the ref. Yeah. This is also not a DQ. Let me stop you there for a second. When Raisha pulled her out, I thought, okay, perhaps Raka Khan is distracting the ref because I couldn't see anything. And then Raka and Raisha began to double-team Christy in the apron, and I did some math in my head. The only other person in this match is Awesome Kong, and she's currently laying on the ground. Yeah. Is the ref distracted by taking her pulse? So Christy goes back in the ring, and then Raisha hit the ring, which you'll recall is what the seven-foot male Kip James did in the women's match earlier. That was not a DQ. And, of course, here it was a DQ. So, anyway, the old rule about the title changing hands in a DQ, apparently they forgot about that as well. So Christy Hemme beat Awesome Kong via DQ, and the girls had a big pull apart afterwards, and they sent out a bunch of geeks. The only good thing about this was the fans were chanting, let them fight. So even though I have no desire to ever see these two wrestle again, the fans do. So I will defer to the fans and say thumbs up for booking that pull apart. Uh, there was a point where, of course, the, the, the whole story of this little feud is that Christy is the, the playboy model, the pretty girl who is now be- trying to become the uh, legit serious wrestler, and the problem is that's largely true, and uh, there's a point outside where she went for a kick on Kong, and Kong caught her foot and pushed her backwards, and Christy took a bump on the floor, and Christy's head missed, uh, hit the like the very edge of the the pretty black mats, and if she had been three inches to her right, her head hits the concrete, and that is bad, bad times. Please be careful with this girl. Beer money against Matt Morgan and Abyss for the tag titles. I uh, I was very annoyed early by by Beer Money stalling for seriously about 17 straight minutes. And it went past the point of, of heel, good heel heat for me into just complete annoyance. But at the end, the place was going haywire, so I will defer to the fans once again and say, fine job, beer money. And in fact, the finish of this match was awesome. They had an average match, two stars, but the finish was great as we had uh, Storm getting the beer bottle, Abyss cut him off, and he was about to hit Storm with the bottle, but Jackie jumped in the ring to beg off. Which, of course, by the way, was not a DQ, but we'll just move on. So, as she was begging, uh, Storm, who was behind her, took Nux out of his tights and slid him on. And when I say this, this was straight out of Memphis in 1975. Yes. He reached dramatically into his pants, he pulled out the Nux, he raised his hand as high over his head as he possibly could, he slid them on so that astronauts could have seen this, and the fans were screaming in either anger or terror, one or the other. And, of course, then he punched Abyss in the face, made the cover, the ref counted the pin, and uh, the finish was just, it brought utter joy to my heart how awesome this was. <laughs> Beer money is just the best. I, 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 too, was annoyed by their stalling at the beginning, but I will say this. I think they may know more about wrestling than you and I do. Well, they're pretty good. So I, I will defer to them on that. Uh, and the, the match itself was... Fine. Finish was good. And again, they can never let anything uh, anything alone in this. They have to find something to annoy me. So in here, what it was was Mike Tanay, in the middle of this encounter for the Tag Team Championship of the World, very casually mentions that the X Division belt has been held up and the OD will hit on Thursday. <laughs> Just slip it down under the door. Wow. The Another championship has been held up. It's in dispute. And they mention this as a throwaway line during another match. Well, who cares anyway? Uh, that's apparently the message. Don't care, anyone. So the Machine Guns met with Foley backstage and had a great idea about how to mend fences, and basically Shelley wanted Foley to hand the tag title briefcase to him. Alex Shelley and Mick Foley were awesome in this segment. Awesome! 
And then after they left, Foley said he'd take it under advisement. And he told Lauren after the guns left that someday that young Shelly was going to get what he deserved. And it would happen under his watch. And he said, it will not happen tonight, however. Thursday. To which Lauren replied, Thursday? As if to say, what is Thursday? <laughs> Apparently forgetting that they have a weekly television show Thursday. This actually is completely realistic because I guarantee nobody watches the show in TNA. I and bet they have no idea what day impact. I was is going on. to say, perhaps she thinks they're live. Yeah. And basically they just think that she does she thinks they do two shows every other Tuesday night. Yeah. So anyway, again, we spent thirty dollars for a plug for Spike show. Machine guns came out again, sat chairs in the ring, just like on Raw. Cornette came out instead and said they need to leave right now or they would be in trouble. And Shelly wanted to know what he was going to do about it. Made a couple of jokes. Said, what are you going to hit us with a tennis racket? Do we look like the Midnight Express? Do we look like the Rock? Actually, I think they said Rock and Roll Express. Anyway, Cornette said he was going to get the baddest security guard he had to fend them off. They didn't care. So then the lights went out. The word suicide appeared above the ring. A man slid down to the ring on a cable and beat both men up. And I swear to God, as I was typing what was happening, they had already cut to the back. So this was like the lamest debut I think I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, I'm uh, sure I think it's something lamer, but it was lame. It, you know what killed it for me was the zip line. The, 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 the so zip line. ghetto. Yeah, well, it, it looked lame. And you and I have both of the same reaction, a hearty belly laugh, which I don't think was the intent. <laughs> but all, all I can think was, okay, so you're you're at the uh, the, the carnival here, you're you're the, you're at the circus, you're in the, like the trapeze swinging down to the ring. When you get there, there's still two guys who are going to kill you. <laughs> Way to go! And also, this wasn't that high. I, I think at his highest point, he was maybe 12 feet above the ground, but. You know, I, I t- as far as I could tell, he had this wacky device he was holding onto by his hands. And if his hand slipped, he could have been hurt. That was a, a stupid, dangerous thing. And the only payoff was it made us laugh, which I don't think was the payoff they wanted. Angle and Rhino, where if Angle won, he got Jared in January. And if he lost, he had to quit TNA. Rhino came out with, with uh, Foley, and Angle came out with nobody. Yes, after plugging... Uh, twice on Impact and earlier during the show that he had a mystery corner man to take care of Mick Foley. He came out alone and nobody mentioned a thing. And they had to make sure that, that we knew the match would not end until this man came out. So they had this little match. I gave it two and three quarter stars. It was fine. Uh, they did some stuff. Actually, it was funny because Rhino had mentioned that um, he was about to up the violence. And then the match started they started doing headlock takeovers. <laughs> the, the violence was notched down several degrees. Where is Jim Cornette? I you don't know, know what I would pay to have Jim Cornette come over and watch an Impact pay-per-view with me? I would chip in. My life savings I would pay for this. The only flaw is that you'd have to uh, drive in. That's true. That's true. Maybe. I'd have to pay for his trans, too, which actually may be my life savings. So, anyway, they had a match, and Angle went to grab a chair near the end and fully told him, you do that, and uh, you're yeah. out of here. This is after, of course, they had a ref bump. Of course, ref bump. So, suddenly, who should head to the ring but Al Snow, who responded by slapping Mick Foley. So, Foley went to talk to him, which allowed Rhino to uh, take a chair shot to the head for the pin. And uh, Mike or Angle grabbed the mic afterwards and told Foley, and I quote, You're next, you old son of a bitch. I am going to beat the shit out of you. Have a nice day. And the Al Snow thing, Al looked great for 45. I'll give him that. It's amazing. With that said, it, I, I maybe he'll be there Thursday, but seeing as now this is TNA, I expect to never see Al Snow again. Have no explanation for what Al Snow did. I do not expect an Al Snow versus Rhino match, which a normal person would expect. I just don't think they'll ever use him again because well, it's TNA. Anything could happen. I, I I would not be surprised if he shows up. I would not be surprised if he is not even mentioned on Thursday. But uh, all I know is that he walked out, and there were rumors there might be Terry Funk, and they, they could have thrown out a million names of, of, of guys, wrestlers who are out of work right now, not doing anything they could have brought in. But Al Snow walks out. And Mike Tanay summed up, I think, the feelings of everyone when he screamed, It's Al Snow? <laughs> like, this is the best we could do? Yes. For those who are wondering, it was supposed to be Frank Trigg, but of course, they didn't clear it with Trigg first, and he was unavailable. Welcome to TNA! I'm, I swear to God I'm writing a book about TNA someday. You fool! Well, I'll be, I'll, I, I've already determined I will have to be in my 100th year, because I do not expect to survive it. But the title of the book will be, Welcome to TNA. And it is going to be a, a recap of every impact. That's all it's going to be. Actually, I could just <laughs> compile that long. right now. <laughs> sure. So then the blonde interviewed Sting and his crew, 
And I got to say this right now. I, I run down TNA a lot and this and that, but I'm going to actually say something positive here. There's one thing TNA does better than anybody else in the world right now, and I believe that that is Lauren. You never notice it because this is such a shithole of a program, but Lauren is the best backstage interviewer of any girl in wrestling. She's oh, really good. Of any girl, for sure. Yeah. And, and Well, yeah, except when they draw her into it, like when Rhino specifically tells her leave, or in this case, she she looked at him and said, I should go, shouldn't I? And he said, yes. But Or when the, the beautiful people mock her for no good reason. But that's not her fault. No. When she just left alone to do her job, she's awesome. She she knows her questions. She, she seems to know exactly what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. And I give Lauren two thumbs up. And after she asks her question, she holds the microphone and does not steal the attention. No, she just stands there in the background. Yes. So, of course, now I'm sure she'll be fired within two weeks. But then we had Team 3D, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe against Sting, Nash, Steiner, and Booker T, where if anybody in the front line got a pin over anybody in the mafia, AJ got the world title and the label of the best wrestler in TNA. Now, I don't know about you, Vinny. I was, I was trying to pay somewhat close attention, but did they even make much of a deal of any of the baby faces near falls? Like, wow, he could be world champion. Oh, no. Devon could be world champion right here. Well, of course not. Devon could win the world title right here for AJ. That's right. Yeah, I guess that's how it works. But, but the your whole point, stipulation is completely absurd. Your point is still valid. They never once said we almost had a new world champ. I just don't... I'm not going to go on about this stip. Everybody knows the stip. Everybody knows how stupid it is. So, anyway, they had a... I gave this three and a half stars. It was a pretty damn good match. It kind of fell apart there at the end. It, well, uh, it totally fell apart, but they somewhat pulled it back together. It broke down into an eight-man, and bodies were everywhere. And they tried to do the WWE deal where everybody hits a big move, but people were in the way. I think people were taking moves that maybe they didn't know were coming. I know that Sting Sting took a, a suplex from AJ and looked like he was nearly killed. Then Joe gave Sting an exploder, and Sting managed to lay it on his face. You know, for those of you who have seen an exploder, how does a man land on his face? I have no fucking idea. But Sting did. I thought he was killed. So it finally came down to Joe and uh, Sting, and Joe was going for the muscle buster on him. But Nash hit him in the nuts, and then Sting hit the death drop for the pin. So this was, in fact, the second pay-per-view in a row where Joe has been pinned after a nut shot, which begs the question, why don't you get a fucking cup, for Christ's sake? So, anyway, that was that. Joe has to be turning heel after all these jobs. There's no other explanation. I figured sure it would there be, is. I figured it would be in this match because the only thing to me that made sense here was Joe would uh, Joe would have the opportunity to get the pin but realize, why am I getting this pin when I'm just giving the belt to some other guy and turn heel? But, of course, that made, I guess, too much sense, so that didn't happen. But, anyway, uh, thank God Sting was alive. Afterwards, he took his belt and he walked to the back and, and uh, he kind of pouted. And the Mafia looked at him with this what-the-fuck look on their faces, but then they celebrated on their own. So they're not even being subtle about it. Sting is about to turn babyface, unless yes. this is all a big swerve. And they all turn babyface, and he stays heel. <laughs> that would be awesome. Something wacky. That would be tremendous. But there you go. The match was generally pretty good, which is, I, I, I'm going to knock it now, or knock details out. But on the whole, I assure you, except for the part with the other part at the end, it was all pretty good. But we noticed, uh, watching Impact last week, I don't think we mentioned the show, but Samoa Joe is getting really fat. And uh, it's starting to the get to the point where it's not just cosmetic. It looks like it's starting to affect his performance. There's a part where Steiner went to lift off on the turnbuckles, and Joe couldn't get up there, and it took a couple tries, and that looked bad. So uh, that's no good. And then there's a point, well, just several points, actually. This was not Kevin Nash's best night. He tried hard. He was taking bumps like a real pro wrestler and everything. <laughs> actually, there was an awesome spot where... Bubba Ray Dudley, of all people, went to yes. give Nash a back suplex, and Nash did not want to go up. No. And he tried to deadweight him, and Bubba was like, fuck you, old fuck man. Fuck you, you big fucker. And he got him up in the air and gave him the back suplex, and... I mean, he did it safe. I mean, there was no danger, so I just laughed like a madman, but uh, that was great. Yes, and and, and speaking of guys, uh, we, we talked about guys taking scary suplexes. We talked about the stuff Sting took from AJ and Joe, and even in the beginning, there was a bit where Joe was just uh, running wild with uh, chops and forearms and kicks, and it doesn't sound that bad, but he was wailing on this old man, just hammering on Sting. Yeah. I felt very bad for Sting by the end of this match. So anyway, that was the show, everybody. I give it a solid thumbs in the middle. Uh, per usual TNA standards, there were not the, the great matches you normally see on a TNA show. But uh, the opener and the main event were very good. So I think with two very good matches, you can give it a thumbs in the middle. But and then there was the, the Eric Young match was fun, and the tag match was fun. So and the machine guns were awesome. The machine guns were always awesome. So anyway, that's the story. To the back! We're going to just get on with Impact. And my new... 
My new, I need to get a stopwatch because my, my new idea is I will not spend a single minute more talking about this show than there was wrestling on the actual program. Now, for those of you wondering how much time was on this particular edition of Impact, if you recall, most shows this year have been around 21, 22 minutes. There was a show that was around 30 that was like a, a, a spectacularly long, uh, wrestling heavy edition of Impact. This show, take a guess how many minutes of wrestling were on the show, Vinny. Less than usual. Um, I will say 17. 17 minutes and 55 seconds of wrestling on this two-hour program. Amazing. Better yet, better yet, starting at 9.58 p.m., it was 37 minutes between matches. They went 37 minutes between wrestling matches. 37 minutes. That is almost the exact airtime of ECW. 37 minutes between matches. Why does pe- Why do people watch this show? I don't know. I'm going to open up the phone lines later just so I can chit-chat with some people because I, I enjoy that far more than reviewing this show. All right, so it is now 10 minutes into the show. That means by 27.55, we are going to be done talking about this program. All right. I refuse to spend more than 17 minutes and 55 seconds talking about Impact, so here we go. And by the way, I had an idea this week. Since there's a big to-do on the board about whether I should review Impact or not, and people are pitching a fit, a fit about the, the possibility of not reviewing the show, I thought of coming on here, and I thought of saying, here is the Impact review. Eric Young versus the terrorist, 3 minutes, 10 seconds. Alex Shelley versus Black Machismo, 1 minute, 55 seconds. Abyss versus James Storm, 4 minutes. Sojourner Bolt versus Chrissy Emmy, 3 minutes and 30 seconds, which was, in fact, more time than Alex Shelley and Black Machismo got. Yes. And Brother Ray and Kurt Angle, 5 minutes and 20 seconds. Show sucked. Review over. Let's move on. No, hang on. Is that not what people asked for? I, There's your fucking review. I actually have a problem with this. If I must watch this bullshit... Then I must spend time ranting about it. If you want to get the results and read the time limits, I'll just come over here at, uh, what time is it now, 11.30? Yeah. I'll just come over at 11.30, we'll just skip right through the show. All right, well. But if I'm going to watch this show, then God damn it, I'm going to talk about it. Oh, well, let's talk about this show then. Now, you know when people get drunk, they always say, I am so drunk, and they start repeating everything. I've done that at a Christmas party or two. All right, I just want to know if I've if I've said yet that this show sucked. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, well, this show sucked, everybody. And it had 17 minutes and 55 seconds of wrestling. No buys. So, the main event mafia came out, and today said the front line was this close to getting the belts at the pay-per-view, which would have given them, quote, the political clout they need. Yes, political clout and leverage. Please explain. Yeah, that's exactly what I wrote down. Please explain what this means. Why having the belt... First of all, why does having the belt give you political clout and leverage? Second of all, what are you going to do with this political clout and leverage? Uh, uh, what does this belt have to do with anything? Does the champion get to make matches? <laughs> does, the the champion, champion, does the champion get to fire or not fire people at will? Perhaps the champion gets to book the show. What, is, what does Sting have... Because he's a champion. What well, extra uh, does he have? I will tell you what he does not have, and that is star power. Because even though Sting is the champion, Kurt Angle is still the star of the main event mafia. Well, that's true. So he cut a promo on Jarrett, saying he hated him more than any boss he'd ever worked for, including Vince McMahon. Said Jarrett tried to kill his career in TNA. He had to know that someday he was going to have to step into the ring with Kurt. Told Jeff to buy his kids some wonderful presents because it, it, their father would be dead in the new year, I guess. AJ came out and said Jarrett was going to kill Angle the pay-per-view. He cut a promo on Sting. Wanted to know how Sting could possibly live with himself after getting a win over Joe in such a flagrantly uh, screw job manner. Like there's never been a screw job in TNA before. <laughs> there's a screw job in every single main event. This is a history there setting. was a screw job in the main event tonight. That's a, that was a precedent setting event. I just like that as he is ranting about asking, is this the right way? Is this how you do things with honor and dignity? And as Edgy is saying this on the ramp, there's a shot of the monitor of uh, the, the the big TV screen behind him of Kevin Nash nodding in affirmation. Yes, this was the right way. So, anyway, Angle grabbed the mic, told AJ to shut up and come say this to Sting's face. So AJ said, fine, you all get out of the ring and and uh, I'll do this. So they all got out of the ring. AJ got in the ring. They got in a, a brawl, him and Sting, and then the Mafia jumped in and beat him up. So, remember that, by the way, everybody. Remember that. 
So then the entire front line, all 14 of them, ran down to the ring, including Joe with a steel pipe, because God knows he needs one at this point. They uh, beat up all the heels, sent them packing, and Angle promised that one member of the front line would be taken out tonight. Clearly he has the booking sheet. Apparently he does. And then as the Mafia bailed, Mike Tanay said, look at the Mafia bail! And I thought, yeah, they're outnumbered three to one, and one of them has a stick. They are not cowards. During this match, I received a phone call. I left the room for ten minutes. I came back. I don't give a fuck what I missed. Thank you. So we had Eric Young and Sheik Bashir. First match, 20 minutes into the show. So this is a first-round tournament match for the vacant X title. They put the champion and the former champion in together in the first round. Yes. Does this happen in sports? Well, no. Of course not. No, the top two teams are usually put in separate opposite ends of the bracket so that they can meet in the final. Not to mention, Sheik Bashir, the former champion, was beaten in two minutes. So... <laughs> What a champ he must have been. Yeah, the, the, the only thing you missed of any note was there was a meeting with Jarrett and Foley. Jarrett basically stepped down as owner. He said he was only a wrestler now and said Mick Foley was in charge. So that was the, that was all you missed. Uh, the sheet came out. That's kind of a, that's kind of a big angle and they never mentioned it again no. throughout the entire show. They never mentioned it again. I never even knew till right now. Yeah, they never mentioned it again. Jarrett never even appeared again on the show. So, yeah, that's what you missed. You leave room for ten minutes and you miss a major plot point. But anyway. So the sheet came out, and Mike Tanay says, look at the towel on his head. And I thought, Jesus Christ, that's an offensive thing to say. And then it turns out he actually was wearing a towel on his head. He had the towel with uh, Shane Sewell's blood on it as a turban. Wow. And I, in a way, I thought that was actually more offensive, that he just started wearing, actually literally wearing a towel on his head. Okay, hurry up, hurry up. We're only, we already got six minutes, and we have ten minutes left. Uh, Shane Sewell was not the ref, and there really was nothing about this. That's actually, it. there was. There Bashir was. The sheik hit the ref from behind, knocked him on the ground, and then was still pinned clean. Yeah. So they had a ref bump for absolutely, literally no good reason. So, moving on. we got to get going. We've only got ten minutes left. So, then we had Bubba giving the front line a pep talk. Reminded Joe that he was, quote, the last of the legit old school tough guys. Please explain. So, everyone else is a fake tough guy? Exactly, yes. Everyone else is a real pussy? <laughs> right. You're the last of the legit old school tough guys. Who writes this show? Jackasses, that's who. So, anyway, the rest of them, uh, he said he was going to make Kurt an offer he couldn't refuse. So then Foley came out of the main event mafia locker room, laughing and cackling. And then they all came out and laughed and cackled with him. And Foley said they are good guys, just misunderstood. Never had a follow-up. Hell of an authority figure. Why does he like them? Why do they like him? Why was there no follow-up? Who gives a fuck? I don't know. Beautiful people who were in their throne room with the fake Sarah Palin. As I mentioned on the show the last time, there was a, uh, they have their fake, they have their throne room, and then they wanted Booker T's locker room, and the question was why? This week, they not only had two thrones, gold everywhere, but they had three flat screen televisions. Why the fuck would they want Booker's locker room? I don't know. Anyway, they were ranting and raving and this and that, and uh, and this segment made me hate the beautiful people. And they used to be my favorite part of this program. They announced Brutus Magnus is coming. Brutus Magnus! <laughs> I don't know who this is, but that's his name. Uh, very quickly on the beautiful people segment, they were concerned that uh, Governor Sarah Palin was going to take them to the White House, and they're not prepared. Why is the governor taking them to the White House? Well, it's very simple, Vinny, because these assholes that write the show don't even know who won the election. <laughs> Apparently. Jay Lethal and Alex Shelley, ex-title tournament match. Lethal wiped him out with a dive early. And note I used the term early. That's what I wrote in my report. I was wrong. It was Literally like ten seconds later, Lethal was pinned. This match went less than two minutes. <laughs> no fucking buys. He was he was hit in the balls and then pinned with a crypt kryptonite crunch. A waste of two men. It was horrible. And then suicide attacked. Then suicide came down in a zip line and beat them up and tried to use a move from the video game and he fucked it up. Yes. And it still aired on television. Yes. Way to go, TNA. Amazing. The zip line's got to go. Did you ever think about this has to go? The zip line is so unbelievably ghetto. <laughs> I can't even explain the ghetto ness of this zip line. The only except thing, there needs to come a time when he comes down the zip line and they've got like a net waiting for him. Sure, or just cut the zip line when he falls into the, the crowd. <laughs> Something like that. So then we had the, um, and by the way, that is not a tasteless remark because the zip line, he is no higher than about five feet above the crowd. So then we had the segment here with Abyss and Matt Morgan. Morgan lectured him about his drinking. Ridiculous. And then Abyss said he made a mistake and would not do it again. He also said he thought Family Guy was real, and Morgan had to explain it's just a cartoon. 
They had a rough cut with James Storm. Best this, thing on the show. This was so awesome and so horrible. It was awesome because it talked about a story about being an amateur wrestler, growing up loving wrestling, and having to quit wrestling when his dad died to take care of his mom, and then he saw an ad for to, for pro wrestling training and got into it and busted his ass and got to TNA. This made him the best hero on the planet Earth. He's a heel. And then the next thing we saw was him walking out to be evil. Sam, Storm. Storm, Storm and Abyss had a beer bottle on a pole match, and they had a bucket hanging from a pole that read, and I quote, Beer on a pole. That's, That's what, what it I, said. That is what it said, everyone. Yeah. Hokey. So, anyway, they Storm got the bottle, but he ate a black hole slam. Then Abyss grabbed the bottle, but Jack... I'm just going to read this verbatim so Go you can see it. how stupid this fucking thing Enjoy. was. Enjoy. Storm got the bottle, but as he went to use it, he ate a black hole slam. Abyss grabbed the bottle, but Jackie rushed in, stole it, raced up the ramp. She was stopped by Morgan. She tried to climb into the ring. She was too slow. Morgan got her. Went to get her. Rude gave him a low blow. Rude whacked Abyss with a chair. Storm got the pin. Bad guys attacked Abyss. Morgan made the save. Bounced him around. Storm cracked him in the back of the head with a beer bottle. That was the end. Actually, no, then Abyss made the save. Did he? There was one more save in there. I don't there. give a fuck. That was so much bullshit in, in, in six minutes of TV. Six minutes? It wasn't even six minutes. Let's the, look into the times for that match. Well, the, uh, there was the match. The match itself was four minutes. Everything everything after that was at least two. I'll see what about that. So then we had Borash interviewing Sting and the Mafia about AJ's accusations that he was a not an honorable man. Nash would not let him talk, saying he had discussed this Sunday. They agreed that the Mafia hadn't done it. The front line would have. That is their justification. Said the front line got what they deserved. Then Bubba went down to the ring and uh, demanded Kurt come out, and he said, no funny stuff and no gimmicks, which that's asking a lot from Kurt Angle, no gimmicks. So Bubba told him there was a potential for a lot of blood, broken bones. He said TNA could be destroyed. Then what? They'd have to end back to WWE. Everybody booed. So anyway, he said, I got an idea. Tonight, one-on-one, -on -one, me and you, the losers group has to disband. Okay. He actually said that in that promo? Yeah. Because I didn't notice it until he was talking to, to Joe later. Yeah. So, yes, okay. Now, yeah. now, hold on a second. This is why the show sucks so bad. <laughs> so, he goes into the locker room to explain this to everybody, and they all finally leave, including Devon. And, um, if I'm not mistaken, in the very first segment on this show, Angle told the Mafia to leave the ring so he could face Sting a one on one, and they left the ring and then immediately jumped him. So, what babyface in his right mind? would trust the main event mafia after that happened? That's a very good None. question. There is no baby face in his right mind. I'm actually even more appalled that they would uh, announce that the main event would settle their main event war for once and for all, and I didn't even realize it until the segment later. Not to mention that if things had gone according to plan, and I had noticed it the first time, that still would have meant they announced their the main event to end their top feud with a 90-minute uh, build. Yeah, exactly. And it was actually only an hour build. And by the way, we're only got five minutes left, so we got to hurry. So then we had the uh, machine gun storming out when when uh, when Bubba told him to leave, which was funny. And we had a graphic appearing on the screen saying, "In seven minutes, they were going to open up a briefcase." We had more talk. Kurt was backstage with the mafia and, and sent them packing. Then we had backstage with the beautiful people and the fake Sarah Palin, where we had more stuff about them going to the White House. Then we had back to the briefcases. We had Hernandez getting the world title shot, which it took about 10 minutes to reveal. And then they announced that Curry Man had been fired. But because this is pro wrestling, and because in pro wrestling every Japanese person has to be retarded, Curry Man had no idea what was going on. No. So they had to take him backstage and explain to him, and he finally was ranting and raving and, and screamed, Lauren, one more dance! And then he was taken out, and that was at least funny. And then they had a graphic for uh, Curry Man, 2008 to 2008. We hardly knew thee. Yes. So I laughed, but at the same time, boy, did they ever make a fucking mockery, a mockery out of this whole deal. Indeed. They, 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 the whole deal, someone losing their job and all, all the... The risk they had greatly taken was turned into a giant joke. Run low on time here. Uh, it, is, it has been 37 minutes, by the way, since the last wrestling match. And after waiting 37 minutes on total nonstop action, let me repeat that. After waiting 37 minutes on total nonstop action for a wrestling match, what did I get? Christy Hemme and Sojourner Bolt. Right. Who got longer than Alex Shelley and Jay Lethal. <laughs> Almost twice as long. This sucked. <laughs> this was a bad match. Christy Hemme is horrible. 
Sojourner Bold, I met her actually in Derby City Wrestling. A very nice girl. I very much like Sojourner Bold. She's very green. This match was bad, and it went four minutes long. And then afterwards, after Christy won, the highlight of this, by the way, was Christy Shorts. After she won, she offered a handshake, and Sojourner Bolt beat her up, and that was the end of the segment. Yeah. You, you spent more time talking about that than I thought it deserved. Then we had the, uh, let's see, where are we? Then the, the, there was the Korean man stuff. And then we, we had the main, two minutes to finish this. The main event was Kurt Angle versus uh, Bubba Ray. They were emphasizing this is a one-on-one match, which yeah. is apparently such a great novelty that it had to be emphasized over and over it and did. over again. They, they cut to the announcers who were sitting there in front of the crowd, and with a very with graveness in their voice, they announced, this is a one-on-one match. In fact, my name's exact quote was, if there ever was a definition of a one-on-one match, this is it. Yeah. This one. So, anyway, in matches in TNA where there's crowd brawling at least once per show for an extended period of time, of course, in this match, it ended up in a count-out which actually was not a count-out. According to Don, it wasn't, I quote, a disqualification because they couldn't make it back to the ring. That's what Don said. So, they uh, brawled backstage. Bubba went through a wall. He bled like a motherfucker. They brawled outside. Of course, here comes the mafia. The dipshit baby faces actually left. As stupid, as fucking stupid as they could be, they left. So, they beat the shit out of Bubba with pipes, chairs, plunder, metal, and frankly, Bubba, the dumb shit, got what he deserved. But anyway, Sting was watching on, and then he turned and walked off, and Bubba was left pretty much dead in a bloody heap. And uh, it was a heavy angle to head out uh, to end the show. Um, Bubba apparently is not back next week, so good for TNA. They did something right. But this was, this was aside from the, uh, the James Storm thing, the only shining beacon on an ungodly, horrible show. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. No buys. And by the way, if this impact review felt rushed to you, this was in fact the exact same amount of time as all of the wrestling on this program put together. Yes. Thank God I'm done with that. To the back! Lance Hoyt faced Rhino, everybody. During this match, they announced a cage match for tonight. That's right, tonight. Didn't bother announcing it last week. (laughs) Well, the funny thing was... You were you started to ask why are they doing a cage match tonight? And I looked at the, the screen and there was no cage there, and I said, "Well, they're not." And then I realized, did the announcers talk about this? Because I was watching the show and they mentioned it so quickly and so offhandedly, I didn't even realize it. They did. So, what we have here is a cage match for no reason to main event this show with zero build, and then even when they tried to build, they failed. Well, it gets better. They announced there was a cage match on the show tonight. They started talking about how Rhino was getting a title shot at the pay-per-view. And at that point, I was like, did I miss an impact here somewhere? Did I miss, did I actually boycott last week's show, or was I so drunk that I don't remember? So, anyway, after after he won, Rhino did a promo and called out the front line. And by the way, I have no idea why Saban and Shelley are still in the front line if they hate it so much, or why ODB is there. Rhino was appalled at the heels had beaten up Bubba Ray. These dumbasses took Kurt Angle's word for it, and Rhino was offended. Rhino was angry. He should be angry at himself, not the front, not the uh, main event mafia. So then he plugged the cage match tonight, and then AJ started talking about a tag team battle that would take place later this evening. And at this point, I thought, you know, is it asking too much for you to open the show with a graphic of all the matches that are going to be taking place on this tonight show? Is this too much to ask? Clearly, yes. So then, God is my witness. After this was over, after this was over, they put up graphics for all of the matches that were going to be on the show tonight. They put up the graphic after everybody had talked about the matches. Yes. Why would you not put that up first and then have the people talk about it? I don't know. (laughs) This seems like such (laughs) common sense. (laughs) That would be doing something right. In TNA, they do everything wrong. It's like the most common sense thing that you open the show, you show a graphic of the matches that are going to take place tonight, and then the guys cut promos about said matches. You know what's funny? Is Here, that's... they're cutting promos about matches, which you assume are tonight, but you don't know, and then they show the graphic. You know what's funny about that? That's how it works in literally every other sporting event on the planet Earth. Did they show the graphic first? They, 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 if you were to watch a football game, you will see Denver Broncos versus Indianapolis Colts. And then two men will talk about it for a while, and then the game will begin. 
Amazing. Yes. This is this is a high concept. Yes. I, and I also must add, during this uh, graphic of showing all the matches, they put up a women's tag match and announced that this match was signed because of what happened on ODB's angle earlier today. Which they had not shown yet. Then they moved on. Yeah. <laughs> I was left thinking, okay, they said it was earlier today, and therefore this could not have been something I missed last week. So all we know is that something happened on ODB's angle, and I thus must care about this match. Fail! Then we had Borash interviewing Angle, who promised bloodshed and a special guest later on. Crystal interviewed the machine guns. I think it's Crystal. It's either Crystal or Lauren. Which is the one that I like. I think it's Crystal. Right? I think it's Lauren. No, I don't think so. Lauren's the one that danced with the curry man. Is she gone? I believe so. I believe this is Crystal, everybody. Whoever this girl is, I like her. She does a good. She's good at her job. She's very good at her job. So anyway, and kind so of, of course they embarrass her several times every week. They did. They embarrass her. They they the uh, machine guns actually cut a promo about how awesome they were, which in fact made them more awesome. <laughs> this does, however, is... bring up a question that somebody maybe it was Lance that brought this up or Catrere. Somebody brought this up, but at the pay per view, Mick Foley said that he was going to deal with Alex Shelley, but not tonight, Thursday, and then the girl said. Thursday? As if she did I, not know there I was an impact on Thursday. This, yes. Well, anyway, impact came on Thursday, and he didn't deal with him. No. And, in fact, he put him in a tournament to earn a shot at the X title. Right. And that was another Thursday later. What? And he, and he still has not dealt with him. Yeah, this is bad. But, uh, he, he, but they he, were funny. The, the, the guns were awesome here. They mentioned that they are both in the uh, X title tournament and could meet in the finals, at which point they simply said it was win-win for the city of Detroit. And Saban noted that he was a four-time X division belt, and his partner Alex... He was Shelley, a four-time belt? I'm sorry, four-time champion. <laughs> four-time X division champion, and he noted his tag team partner had not uh, had a chance to win the title yet, but he said he turned to him and he said, if you do ever hold that gold, I want you to savor that flavor. <laughs> And then he just turned and looked right into the camera as if he had just spoken profound wisdom. Yeah. He, he was great. So then we had the Guru Chris Saban match with the Sheik watching from the stage. And this was one of the best Impact TV matches in months. Yes. They actually got like... Five minutes, believe it or not. Wow. Which, to, to be fair, for these guys is like eight minutes. Well, that's all the stuff they do. It was it was a great, great match. Yeah. And Saban won with the cradle shock. I, and I gave this two thumbs up. I, I'm going to do this. My only minor complaint. No. What could you possibly complain about? We just watched a Chris Saban heel promo. He's, they were trying to turn him heel, and he was working as a baby I face here. Now, this was awesome, and I, I actually wrote down these words. Hey, TNA, more of this. Yeah, but you don't understand, Vince. They're supposed to be baby faces. That's why he worked as a baby face. I see. Then why did he cut a heel promo? Never mind. Let's move on. Because they're, they're tweeners. I see. But he's supposed to be. They're in the front line, so technically they're baby faces. They're written to be baby faces. Even though they hate everyone on their own team. They're completely incompetent. It's a poor writing truth, is my point, yes. Then it went off the cliff. <laughs> I think that was the end of the show, yes. Sarah Palin bullshit, said the women needed a makeover, and Billy was trying to spit out that this was not the real Palin. They wouldn't listen to him. He couldn't get it out, which was the funny part. I mean, he just couldn't get it out, which, what? I don't know. So finally he stormed out, and for the first time in my entire life, I was like, I understand Billy Gunn. <laughs> this makes sense. That's actually true, yes. But... I relate to Billy Gunn. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. I just can't believe that they've gone through all this time for the Sarah Palin appearance and the Sarah Palin makeover, and they didn't bother giving the beautiful people the Sarah Palin haircut. The haircut? She, Sarah Palin's... They're not cutting their hair. Uh, yeah. Okay, fine. You didn't want to see them with the hairdo? <laughs> it, there's more questions that I have that fine. I will get to in the next skit. That I will accept. So... We had Christy Hemme on ODB's angle, which was an all-time horrible moment in the history of this business. I don't even... This was so bad, I don't even really want to talk about it. I want to start two things towards the end. One, I agree with you at its level of, 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 of poor entertainment value, but in the middle of this, of this historic uh, zenith, Christy Hemme said, and I quote, I feel so blessed to be in TNA. And then there was a fight at the end which I can only compare to an SCTV or Saturday Night Live or Mad TV sketch trying to make fun of pro wrestling. No, that, that, that is giving this too much credit. This this was 
In fact, I can't even say Seattle Public Access because the Youth Wrestling Federation was significantly <laughs> better than this shit right here. This was... I don't even know what this was. This this attack by Raisha and Raka at the end of this segment was beyond anything I've ever seen. And I do not ever need to hear about Hugh Hefner's old balls again. Which oh, no. I did, in fact, hear about on this segment. Yes, yes. The only... The, oh, actually, I won't even say it's a good thing about this. I'll, I'll, I'll praise it during the match itself. There was not a single I good thing about this I do agree, but yes, move on. Then we had Mafia meeting with Foley, and he told him he was a little concerned about what happened with Bubba. He was moderately concerned about the fact that he had tried to kill a man. Yeah. They said, hey, we're just having a good time. And Foley said, you may have crossed the line. Dun, dun, dun. Is that what the whole point of this promotion is? Yeah, it's their whole marketing campaign. Are we told to cross the line on every show? We are encouraged to cross the line. They cross the line. That shouldn't be a problem. In fact, only that, we are told this show is cool because they crossed the line. By the way, first off, I hate that term, cross the line, with such a... I hate it more than WWE Universe, which is saying something, because I really hate that one. And the song at the beginning of this show where they're singing about crossing the line, I just want to shoot my TV set. I, and someday I may. I just like that. Only once, there's one point in that song where they actually cut to the guy singing it. And it's like, who is this yes? And then it just keeps going with the wrestlers. Including this week, by the way, Suicide. Yeah. He has made the opening credits. Angle said Bubba challenged him to a wrestling match and it got turned into a street fight. What do you expect him to do? Foley said, well, I would have done it one-on-one. -on -one. And Angle said the business was built on brotherhood, which is an outright lie. <laughs> and Not that Kurt Angle's ever lied before. Sting walked out in the middle of it and Foley said he wanted their word, no more beatdowns. They all said okay. And he is so fucking dumb. <laughs> Another dumbass babyface no, in TNA. No. He is the dumbest babyface there has ever been. In, in this company or any other. He actually took them at their word that they would. They all said, "Okay, we will never gang up on anyone ever again." And he he said, "Okay," and he, he believed them. He's the dumbest man on earth. What a goddamned fool! Oh, Mick Foley. Oh, my friend Mick Foley. Then we had a rough cut segment with Robert Roode. The supposed Wall Street Maven was talking about how he grew up modestly and worked for pennies on the indie scene. <laughs> Hopefully there will be more to this story. He also, <laughs> the other two things I got out of this were he said he liked hockey, but not monster trucks or G.I. Joe. And uh, he never said this, but it was clear in photos he had one sweet afro once upon a time. We then had the segment I hated more than any segment on this show by a significant margin. It made me not want to ever watch uh, this program again. Actually, that's later on. Hold on. Yeah, this is just a tag match. This was just Steiner and Booker T against Morgan and Abyss. So, anyway, they, they had almost all of the heat during the break. Morgan made a comeback. Charmel ran over to break up Abyss and Booker and took a phantom bump. And this distracted the ref. And then Booker hit Matt in the leg with a pipe, hit the axe kick for the pin. Morgan was out of position. It looked bad. And uh, the heels outsmarted the baby faces again. The, 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 the two funny things here were, one, Booker T broke up a pin, and the announcer noted, well, there's the experience of Booker T. Experience. I guess if you'd only been in one tag match, you wouldn't know, hey, my partner's being pinned. I should stop them. Two, not only was Morgan out of position for the axe kick, Booker T noted he was out of, pos out of position and went to hit different ropes, and so Morgan turned <laughs> to get himself back into bad position. That was bad. They plugged the Brutus Magnus debut again, oh. and I'm not from the U.K., as it's probably pretty clear, since I don't. Anyway, I'm not from the U.K. here, but uh, the reason they, they're bringing this guy to TV so early is they're going to have a U.K. tour soon, and they want a, a guy from the U.K. on the tour. Sure. So if that's the case, why would you not use his real name or his, his U.K. version of the Gladiator's name? Don't know. Why would you Why would you give him a new name? I have no idea. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, I'm trying to think of an equivalent. That's like if... if um, I'll just say, okay, I'll use this. Let's say that you say that TNA was based in the UK and there were all European wrestlers and they had a women's division and they wanted to bring in a, a female star because they were going to tour America. They wanted to, they wanted to bring in an American because they were going to go to America. And so they, they hired Gina Carano and then named her Bambi McFlanagan. Well, that would be dumb. Why would you do that? I, I personally wouldn't. Why did you change this guy's name, TNA? Why did you give him a fake name? If you're using him to... I don't know. There's, there's two things, two very minor things and here. Brutus Magnus? Well, that's also a horrible name. 
But uh, there was a, a moment here, I believe, I think somewhere around the Bobby Roode rough cut, but they uh, put up in 12 minutes. Yeah. And it would be, I think I think they were plugging the uh, angle tribute to Jarrett. But uh, then there was a tag match, and then the tag match ended, which means at the time they put up this promo of what happens in 12 minutes, they knew exactly how long that tag match was going to go. So thankfully, things were not conveniently for them. That's negative. Here's a positive. They were plugging some TNA live shows, one of which was apparently taking place at a building called, and I am not making this up, Bojangles Coliseum. <laughs> which, if there is a, a TNA Impact 2 video game, I demand Bojangles Coliseum be like a hidden ring you can get. That would be awesome. Then the show, then the show just got lame. Angle came out for the Jarrett deal to talk about Jeff Jarrett's history. He talked about his time in WWF and WCW, mentioned his tag team with Owen Hart, and the fans chanted, Owen! And they were all happy or sad or whatever the case might be, respectful of Owen Hart. And, and then Angle started talking about the history of TNA, and he doesn't even know TNA history, as he said, it all started with a two-hour primetime show. Actually, it was one hour, Kurt, and they needed two hours because there was not enough time for uh, everything in one hour. So this all led to a plug for Genesis, where he said that the Jeff Jarrett story would come to a tragic, tragic end. He said that Jeff Jarrett was going to die. He was going to drown in a pool of his own blood. And then he showed pictures of Jeff Jarrett's children, his three daughters on the big screen, and he said, after the pay-per-view, these little girls would become orphans. This in the same fucking promo that he mentioned Owen Hart, who also left orphans. Indeed. What a bunch of shitty human beings. It's, it's... Yeah. That dregs the society. It is, it, it if is. anybody from TNA that was responsible for this is listening to this right now, I do not feel even the slightest bit bad to call you just scum. Well, and, and for that matter, these three girls themselves are already orphans. Their mother's gone. That's right. This is, yeah. And the, 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 Jared came out and called Angle a worthless son of a bitch, and I just thought, what irony. You, you worthless <laughs> son you of a bitch. You motherfucker. Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is... It was... Your wife dies. <laughs> And your best friend dies. And now you're putting your daughters on national television, and the storyline is that or Angle is talking about making them orphans. Killing you. Just a scumbag. You pretty much got it all there. And uh, I, I can't say it was the worst part about this, but it, it, it really kicked in because the first half of this promo was so great. Talked about everything Jeff had done, and then he said it, it all ends in Genesis when I, I thought he was just going to say, I beat you, or I, I humble you, or humiliate you. No! Murder you! You know why this company's so fucking dumb? It's because Angle's talking about making these daughters orphans, and then Don West gets on commentary and he's just like, this is despicable. Like we're supposed to, like we're supposed to be mad at Kurt Angle. When in reality, everybody watching this show, hearing this shit, they find TNA despicable. Tony Kurt Angle's getting no heat. What person possibly watches it and goes, Boy, I hope Jeff Jarrett beats that Kurt Angle. That can't happen. Not a single person. <laughs> it's fucking feel 2008, that way. and all people think is, What a bunch of scumbags running this show. Everyone knows it's fake. God, this sucked. Everyone And... Uh, and Everyone knows Owen, Hart's really, Owen Hart is really dead. Everyone knows, or they may not know until Jared is really dead, but if they looked into it, they would find out. This was the kind of show that just made me not want to support him at all. The idea of these promos is meant to make you want to buy the pay-per-view. This made me want to not ever put another cent in the pockets of these people. God, this sucked. Jarrett freaked out backstage, and BG tried to calm him down, and Jarrett stormed off, and I just thought, keep going, buddy, just keep going. And then Angle was, was, uh, Angle, oh, no, it was uh, Jarrett, I don't know, fuck this. We had Kyoshi, who was a Kira Raijin of All Japan, formerly, now debuting as a low-rent Great Muda, doing all the stereotypical Japanese spots, like the karate kicks and the nerve holds, and he looked fine, nothing spectacular. He did not look like the Great Muta. Got the pin over, uh, I don't even know, All Consequences Creed. So, on the bright side, they at least are smarter than WWE, which beats everybody in their debut. Yes. So, right. there you go. And speaking of the bright side, uh, there was a point here where Consequences Creed came down, and his music was blaring, and he was greeting fans, and there was a white guy trying to dance, and boy, was he fa failing. That was good. Another horrible segment. Palin and the Beautiful People. This is what they did in this segment. I swear to God. They took the Beautiful People, and they took off all of their makeup. 
so that everybody watching at home in HD could learn that these people really aren't that beautiful and look like most girls you'd see at the gym. And there are actually girls at my gym that look better than, uh, I won't mention any names, but a couple of these girls here in, in uh, well, without their makeup on. <laughs> and uh, why? I, this why is... would you go on national television in HD and tell everybody, you know these girls that we've been pushing as beautiful all this time? They're they just really look hot. like anybody else. Yeah, they're, 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 they're just they're girls. Typical. They just work out a lot. Yes, that was... I, I recall Paul Heyman's quote about saying part of being a great promoter is accentuating everyone's strengths and hiding their weaknesses. This was the opposite of that. Not only that, <laughs> not only that, they took off all their makeup because I guess the fake Sarah, I don't know what the idea okay, was. Well, what the point of any of this because is? Because the fake Sarah Palin was caked in makeup. Yeah, she had bright, deep red lipstick on. So what was she trying to accomplish here? I don't know. This, this None was, of this makes a damn lick of sense. Unbelievably, we don't know why unbelievably the beautiful, We don't know why they put the beautiful people on TV with no makeup. We don't know why the beautiful people believe this is Sarah Palin. We don't know who the Sarah Palin impersonator is or what her goals are. Most importantly, we don't care. Is the whole idea that she's humiliating them? And if so, why? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. And if <laughs> this it is, is so dumb. The more I think about this, the angrier I'm getting. There's a, someone out there who's, who's looked in the mirror one day and thought, hey, I somewhat resemble Sarah Palin. I'm going to take advantage of this by driving down to Orlando and humiliating the beautiful people of total nonstop action wrestling. And Billy Gunn, in all of this time, is unable to text message them, <laughs> it's not real Palin. Palin. Yes. Would it be that hard to send them a text Alert. message? Fake Palin. Just carry a sign. It's not her. Jesus Christ, this sucked. So then we had a rough or uh, an interview with Tanae and Shane Sewell, whose forehead is grotesque, by He's, the way. And I wasn't even watching this in HD. He has gigged himself once or twice. So as it's kind of funny because Dave and I were talking about the storyline on the on the Observer Live show, and Dave's like, "Well, why if he if he was a wrestler, why isn't he wrestling?" And I said, "Well, maybe they could tell a story about how he suffered an injury." Well, that's what they've done. They've announced that Shane Sewell suffered a neck injury, and that's why he's refereeing. Now, that's all fine and dandy. This was, in fact, my idea. But, unfortunately, Shane Sewell is about to return to the ring. Right. So now you've announced he has a neck injury preventing him from wrestling, and he's about to start wrestling again? Uh -huh. These people can't win. No, and, and, and when they do something right, which is uh, sort of what you were just talking about, they do something very wrong, which is where Shane Sewell himself turned to Mike Tanay and said, why am I refereeing the Sheik's matches? <laughs> yes! <laughs> why don't I refer the matches of anyone else? He said, I've requested to not referee them, and I still am. So anyway. So he, he said he needed a job, he couldn't wrestle, so he thanked God for his job refereeing the TNA, and then said he would throw it away if anyone got in his face. Yeah. But he, he did close saying if, if he was fired that Shane Sewell will not leave TNA peacefully. And uh, it, it, was, it was a stupid promo, but his delivery was awesome, and he is still my favorite guy in the company. He was actually very great here. Then we had Raisha and Raka Khan against Christy and ODB in a street fight, and it was, in fact, bad. <laughs> The only good thing about it was uh, Raka Khan's, I guess you can call them shorts. They were so short that she may as well have been nude. And I would have been fine with that, because it would have made this whole thing a hell of a lot better. They had a horrible, wretched match. ODB body slammed Raka, which was a risk to many lives. And then Christy did her leg drop off of the middle rope. To the gut. To the gut, which could not have felt good. And then Kong hit the ring afterwards and beat up both girls, including giving Christy the worst implant buster I've ever seen in my entire life. They, they attempted to edit it. They failed. Suicide then slid down on his zip line, which looks stupider by the week. Kong bailed. The lights went out. He disappeared. This was just... When, when, when you have friends that don't watch pro wrestling and ask you why you like pro wrestling, the idea of pro wrestling that they have in their head... This is what this was. This is bullshit. And you ask yourself, why do I like pro wrestling? <laughs> How, who could like pro wrestling? Who could possibly like pro wrestling when you watch just utter bullshit like this? It, it all sucked. And I, I guess it doesn't matter in the long run, but I'm fairly certain. I, I think this is Rocket Khan's first loss. And uh, they just killed her. Yeah. They just beat the crap out of her and, and, and left her laying, and, and she's humbled now. And it accomplished nothing. Just have her do Playboy. What a pig. I'm not, though. I'm seriously. That That's is her, that is her strongest strength. Is her, her body? Yeah. A, any any movement of the body is a negative. Or speaking. Now we are pigs. 
Oh, they are pigs. I was going to make a comment about what I think of her potential lovemaking skills, but I will not go into that. But I, I will just suggest poor. Now, she does work out. Move on here. So what? It's a sting. Borash interviewed Sting and Nash backstage, and Nash. Kevin Nash said, had my new favorite line ever. <laughs> <laughs> Tanae questioned basically, or, or I'm sorry, Borash basically questioned Sting's integrity. And Nash stepped in and said, how dare you question this man? He turned to Sting, and I swear to God, this is what he said. Sting, you were the gold standard. You were the highest paid guy in the company. <laughs> yes. I don't think he meant this in a lot of way. All I wanted was your money. Yeah. That's why he beat him up all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Nash is so fantastic in... in in many ways. He later said, I'm an old man. I've got a quarter zone shot in my foot. I need your help. Yes. And Sting grabbed his bat and went to help. Yeah. This is a great <laughs> performance by Nash. <laughs> Something. Then we had Foley doing a, an interview, and he basically said that he knew Kurt sometimes said things he didn't mean, and he was going to give him a pass for right now. He said he was taking the mafia at their word there would be no more gang beatings. Fool! Well, the funniest thing was... As How's it fully okay being portrayed as such a goddamn idiot? As he spoke, he got angrier and angrier, and it ended up in almost a Cactus Jack raging promo. And uh, so basically what he said here, because as he got angrier, insisting that, that he was taking the word, it was like what he was saying was, I have to say that I'm taking it at the word. I really don't trust them at all, and I know that before the end of the show, they're going to screw me. Yeah. They make me look like a fool. Nash and Sting against Joe and AJ in a cage match. This was at least fine. Nash tried to climb out early. That makes it automatically better than fine. That makes it incredible. Literally. So they, I would have liked to see all of you guys stop and watch him try and climb. They did some stuff. They did this and that. And finally, AJ climbed over and won, which, of course, left his friend in the ring by himself. So well, okay, they, they double-teamed Joe and beat him up, and they would not let AJ get in. I thought to myself, well, that's kind of a weird way to get there, but at least now it makes sense. The heels have Joe trapped alone in the cage. Fine. And then they did one of those things that I hate, which was AJ is struggling. He's fighting to get into the ring to save his friend, and they keep hitting him with bats uh, so he can't climb the cage and this and that, and finally they slam the cage door in his head so he's completely incapacitated. And that's when Joe just makes his own comeback. <laughs> At this I was point, like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> At this point, Samoa Joe ran wild and took out all five members of the main event mafia. I yeah. swear that happened. So he's taking them all out, and I keep thinking, where's the rest of the front line? Just out of curiosity. Oh, the, the answer, Brian, is they were watching TV and said, let's go get... Oh, wait, no, he's got it. Never mind. Back to the sandwich. He's Yes, he's got it handled. So they they finally uh, locked him in there. Still no front line. They put his arm in a chair, and Steiner whacked it with a steel pipe. Baby faces finally ran down. Sting beat him up, and the heels prevented anybody that got through from getting into the cage. I don't know what happened to Sting. He was out there with about eight men. Okay, here's... Okay, Sting is locked outside, so I thought... Okay, well, that makes sense, because Sting is sort of the, the, the reluctant uh, heel. He's not totally down with these gang gang warfare tactics. And Sting was locked outside, and he was looking inside, kind of confused, and kind of reaching the lock, but the door was locked. And then out comes the front line, and then Sting is just a dick and starts beating them all up. Yeah. Which, by the way, he beat up like four guys by himself. I was going to say, what happened to Sting? No one overpowered him? No. Anyway... So they, the guys couldn't get into the cage, and Joe was left dead. And the only good thing that I could say about all of the wackiness here at the end was at least they had something. What are you doing? What's wrong with my head? Yeah, right into the mic. Oh, sorry. They uh, they said that they uh, basically asked, where was Mick Foley? So they have left a tease for next week. That was the one good thing that they did here. I have I have re I have re-examined my opinion of the show, and I give it one thumb down. Yeah, the first uh, the first part there was pretty much a thumbs up, and then it went spiraling off a cliff, and there was little to save it after that. But but yes, the the Chris Saban Sanjay Dutt match was the best match on the show in months and months. So one thumb down. I won't give it two thumbs down, even though I feel that I should based on the asinine uh, segment with Jared and Angle. But I I hate to punish men like uh, Chris Saban that worked so goddamn hard in that match. So I'll only give it one thumb down. But don't watch this show, everybody. It's not worth it.